aircraft car register 69 degrees. Above the babble of voices can be heard the soft hissing of the steam locomotives, which herald the beginning of a new era. A polished tie of laurel wood has been placed in its ceremonial position by the construction superintendents of both railroads. And then Edgar Mills steps forward, a wealthy banker and friend of the Central Pacific Railroad officials, steps forward and signals for silence. And so a nation as well as the spectators gathered here away as the drama of men's hopes, prayers, and dreams began to unfold on this 10th day of May, 1869. And you are here. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the officials of both railroads, the Union Pacific and the Central Pacific, I bid you welcome. We are met today to commemorate the completion of a project, which is a remarkable example of the vision, the determination, and the labor of thousands of men in the Union, which this day shall be consummated forever. We are assembled here to link the ends of the earth, to join the raw riches of the American West with the finished products of the Industrial East. We are also met this day with mixed emotion, with joy that in a combined effort and a common cause, the brains, the sweat, and the muscle of thousands of men have joined together under the guidance of Almighty God. But it is with profound sorrow that we remember and pay homage to the hundreds of men who gave their lives that we might stand here at this moment and share one with another this sacred occasion. Among those whose presence we are honored to acknowledge at this time include a number of railroad officials from both lines in addition to those taking part in the ceremony. We also take pride in the presence of the 21st Infantry Band. They are under the command of Major Milton Coxwell. We take, we take pride in the presence of many great newspapers from our country. Among those, Dignitaries present include Bishop John Sharp, the railroad bishop representing Governor Brigham Young. We also have Mayor Lauren Farr of Ogden. The beautifully uniformed band is from the Mormon 10th Ward from Salt Lake City. And now, to unite us in thanks to our Creator, may I introduce a man who has traveled many weary miles to be with us today. He is the Reverend John Todd from Pittsfield, Massachusetts. Reverend Todd. From promontory to the country, bulletin, already now, hats off, prayer is being offered. Our Father and God and our Father's God, God of creation and God of providence, Thou hast created the heavens and the earth. Thou hast also created all those who have been here and participated in this program. We give thanks for all the blessings that Thou hast given us, Father. And we ask Thy blessings to be upon us here assembled and upon Thy people everywhere, that peace may flow unto us as a gentle stream, and that this mighty enterprise may be unto us as the Atlantic of thy strength and the Pacific of thy love, through Jesus the Redeemer. Amen. Amen. It is my pleasure to introduce a fellow resident of Sacramento, Dr. H. W. Harkness, who will present two railroad spikes to Dr. Thomas C. Durant of the Union Pacific Railroad and Governor Leland Stanford of the Central Pacific Railroad. Dr. Durant and Governor Stanford will then place these spikes into holes that have already been drilled in the Laurelwood tie. But these are not ordinary spikes. Ladies and gentlemen, these are golden spikes made from pure California gold. Dr. Hargis. Gentlemen of the Pacific Railroad, and those of you who have met with us, the last spike 
needed to unite the Atlantic and the Pacific by a new line of trade and commerce is about to be driven to its place. To perform this act, the East and the West have come together. Never since history commenced her record of human events has man been called upon to meet the completion of a work so magnificent in contemplation and so marvelous in execution. California, within whose borders and by whose citizens the Pacific Railroad was inaugurated, desires to express her appreciation of the vast importance to her and her sister states of the great enterprise which by joint action is about to be consummated. From her mines of gold has been forged a spike. From her laurel woods has been unitized. And by the hands of her citizens, she offers them to become part of this great highway, which is about to unite her in closer fellowship with her sisters of the Atlantic. From her bosom was taken the first soil. Let hers be the last tie and the last spike. And with them, accept the hopes and wishes of her people, that the success of your enterprise will not stop short of its brightest promise. This spike was donat donated by Mr. Frank Marriott, publisher of the San Francisco Newsletter. And in conclusion, I should like to draw your attention to this spot, the gift of David Hughes of San Francisco. On its head is inscribed, the last spot. On three sides, the names of railroad officials, and on the fourth side, this sentence. May God continue the unity of our country as this railroad unites the two great oceans of the world. Dr. Grant? And now it is my pleasure to introduce Mr. F.A. Tritel, the United States Railroad Commissioner and candidate for governor of the great state of Nevada. He will present a spike of pure silver from the famed Comstock Road on behalf of the people of Nevada. Mr. Tritel. Thank you, Mr. Mills. To the iron of the east and the gold of the west, Nevada adds her link of silver to span the continent and wed the oceans! We are highly honored today with the presence of the Honorable Anson P.K. Safford, who is en route to Arizona as the newly appointed territorial governor. He was kind enough to delay his journey in order to make a presentation on behalf of the Arizona Territory. Governor Safford. Ripped with iron, clad in silver, and crowned with gold, Arizona presents her offering that has banded the continent and directed the pathway to commerce. to introduce a man of vision, a man of courage, a humanitarian and one who is highly esteemed by those of us who call him our friend. He is a Californian whose farsightedness has contributed in large measure to the success of this great enterprise. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the president of the Central Pacific Railroad, Governor Leland Stanford. <laughs> 
Gentlemen, the Pacific Railroad Companies accept with pride and satisfaction these gold and silver tokens of your appreciation of the importance of our enterprise to the material interests of the whole country, north, south, east, and west. These gifts shall receive the fitting place in the superstructure of our role. But before driving the last bike in the completion of the Pacific Railroad, allow me to express the hope that the great importance which you are pleased to attach to our undertaking may be in every respect fully realized. This line of rails connecting Atlantic and Pacific and affording to dollars and new transit will prove, we trust, the speedy forerunner of increased facilities. The day is not far distant when three tracks shall be found necessary to accommodate the commerce and travel which shall see transit across this continent. Fred will be moving in one way on each now. track. Granted the demands of cheapness and time. In conclusion, I might add, we hope to do ultimately that which is now impossible. And soon the railroads were about to meet up rail to rail and ocean to ocean and one end to the other in Promontory, Utah. And also a lot of people from all over the country came into Promontory for the historic occasion. And this is a reenactment, by the way, that you're singing. Soon the last rail was laid and the two locomotives, the Union Pacific 119 and Central Pacific 16 and Jupiter, met pilot to pilot as the rails were connected. Then, the where the last bike was Thomas being driven, a laurel wood tie was used in West Evans. On the highest peak of the Rocky Mountains, tie pointing contractor westward. for Denoting the Central this Pacific the great route across at our San continent. Francisco. Today you have made that prophecy. Of there were four spikes for the ceremony, and one was an Arizona spike that was made of gold and silver. One was a Nevada silver spike, and... There were two golden spikes, and the one golden spike was ordered by Frederick Marriott, proprietor of San Francisco Newsletter Newspaper Company, Dr. H.W. Harkness, a Sacramento newspaper publisher and editor, presented the two golden spikes to Leland Stanford, Vice President of the Union Pacific, Thomas Durant, was then presented the Nevada Silver Spike by Mr. Triddle and Arizona's Spike by Governor Safford and the Golden Spike, which is the last spike, and was presented to Durant by Stanford. And then they both shook hands, and also these three spikes you see in this picture are three out of four of the ceremonial spikes used at the original ceremony, and the fourth one is lost to history. And also, I will talk about these spikes a little later. Back. This is the way to India! <laughs> Thank you, General Dodge. Ladies and gentlemen, that moment for which you and the entire nation have been waiting. The driving of the last spike is at hand. At this time, we wish to commend both railroad companies and their workers for their efficiency and hard work in bringing this monumental undertaking to its successful fruition in a record six and one half years instead of the 12 years allotted to the venture. A final presentation will be made in the form of a silver-plated spike ball by Mr. L. W. Coe, president of the Pacific Union Express Company, after which Governor Stanford and Dr. Durant will make a few ceremonial taps on the precious metal spikes with them all. Mr. Coe. Thank you. Railroad officials, honored guests, and friends, it is the honor of the officers and workers of the Pacific Union Railroad Company to add their congratulations upon the completion of this modern-day miracle.
This silver-plated spike ball is symbolic of our good wishes. Yeah. A laurel wood tie was used in West Evans. Tie contractor for the Central Pacific had San Francisco billiard table manufacturers. Strail and Hughes prepare an highly polished tie made from California laurel wood, and the laurel wood tie is seven and a half feet and eight by six inches. And four holes were pre drilled into the tie in order to accommodate the ceremonial spikes. Absolutely. <laughs> At this point, I should explain that the last spike is a regular iron railroad spike that can be driven with the mall. <coughs> Both the spike and the mall have been wired to the transcontinental telegraph line so that people everywhere can hear the blows as the spike is driven. And now, ladies and gentlemen, the moment has arrived. Boston and New Orleans have wired that they are ready and waiting. Indeed, throughout the length and breadth of the country, people everywhere are waiting at every Western Union station. As Mr. Schilling gives a signal that the last spike is driven, a magnetic ball will fall in the dome of the national capital. In San Francisco, the fire alarm bell will ring. A volley of 200 rounds will be fired in salute at Fort Point. And in Philadelphia, the Liberty Bell will ring again. <laughs> Commentary to the country, already now. Dr. Durant has adjusted the spike. The spike will soon be driven. The signal will be three dots for the commencement of the blows. All right, Governor. Leland Stanford took a mighty oh, swing at the spike, oh. but he missed and struck the tie instead. It then Thomas Durant, who was still not feeling well, took a feeble swing and did not even oh. hit the tie, but he also Perhaps missed we need the spike. A railroad, a railroad worker, 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 worker to make had the honor to drive the last done. spike. Three cheers! Three cheers for the Union Pacific Railroad! Hip, 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 hip. Hooray! Hip, 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 hooray! Hip, hip, hooray! And now three cheers for the Washington, D.C. Telegraph for WN Schilling of Western bullet. Union sent the message the last in. Rail is the last rail is The last President Ulysses is S. Grant. <laughs> That the last the Pacific Railroad is completed to a junction 1,086 miles west of the Missouri River, to all the telegraph 690 miles east of Sacramento and City, more California. And finished with D-O-N-E, done. <laughs> America soon went crazy At when that moment, it was heard that the one first transcontinental ended, railroad was began. finished. The golden uh, spike became a symbol of hope for a better way of life with new challenges yet to be solved. From one coast to the other in nine days instead of six months. Then Andrew J. Russell took a picture of all the workers on the locomotives as you could see by this picture. And this is the most famous photograph in American history. All of the people in the picture are all the people who worked on the first transcontinental railroad and businessmen all together. And this photograph is known to be the champagne photo. On the 
the left is Samuel S. Montague, who's with the Central Pacific Railroad, shaking hands with Grenville M. Dodge of the Union Pacific Railroad, who is on the right. And the photo was taken with an 8x10 glass plate because it's called the champagne photo is because you could see by the man on the Jupiter holding a bottle of California champagne and the man on the 119 holding two bottles of California bottles of beer and it represents the east and the west coming together however none of the Chinese appeared in the photograph because they wouldn't let the Chinese appear in the photograph or attend the event also this photo was shown earlier which was when the spikes were on display at the Joslin Art Museum in Omaha from October 2018 till early January 2019 and I will talk about them soon and about the spikes the spikes still exist except for one which is the second golden spike made by Frederick Marriott of the San Francisco newsletter and it's nowhere to be found and like I mentioned it was lost to history and was taken to the newspaper and was lost in the 1906 earthquake and fire which destroyed the Laurelwood tie as well the spike on the left is the Arizona spike gold and silver is what it's made of and the spike on the right is the Nevada silver spike and this is the actual golden spike that they drove and the golden spike belongs to Stanford University in the Cantor Art Center and it's made of gold and alloyed with copper after the first transcontinental railroad was finished that meant Trains could get across the country and made traveling across the nation within under a week instead of going nine months or six months, I should say, more easier. And also, it's what made traveling more easier to get across America from one coast to the other, from sea to shining sea. And it meant people and freight could get across the country within under less than a week. America has been like this for 150 years. On April 2, 1957, Promontory Summit was established as a national historic site and in an effort to preserve the historic right-of-way and work began to restore the line on how it appeared back on May 10, 1869 and a visitor center was built and also two historic Virginia and Truckee steam locomotives which I'll talk about in a bit were used at the site for the reenactments and recognition of the 100th anniversary of the completion of the first transcontinental railroad in 1969 and I will talk about it soon. Also the visitor center was authorized as a national historic site on April 2, 1957. It was authorized for federal ownership by administration by an act of Congress on July 30, 1965 as Golden Spike National Historic Site. The John D. Dingle Jr. Recreation Act signed into law March 12, 2019 redesignated it in, as a National Historic Park. The near city is Corinne, Utah and is approximately 23 miles southeast east southeast of the site. Also, the site's attraction attracts a thousand of people thousands of people May 10 every year to celebrate the completion of the railroad. Also, the railroad has made America change forever. There you have it. From the Transcontinental Railroad. Bulletin. May 10, 1869. We have got train. Met this here in Promontory, Utah. Thank Just you, like Reverend today, Todd.
At this time, it is my pleasure to introduce a fellow resident of Sacramento, so, Dr. H.W. Yeah. W. Harkness, I hope you who will present video. to Dr. Thomas C. Durant this of the Union the Pacific one Railroad by the and Governor Leland Stanford also, of the Central Pacific Railroad, video, two so railroad spikes. Dr. Enjoy Durant the and clips. Governor Stanford will then place these spikes into holes so that have already been drilled in the Laurel Wood tie. These are not ordinary spikes. Ladies and gentlemen, like these the are golden spikes made occasion. from pure California gold. From 50 Dr. years ago. And so this Gentlemen of the Pacific Railroad, and those of you who have met with us, all board. The locomotives that met in Promontory, Utah was the Union Pacific 119 and Central Pacific 60 named Jupiter. So here's some history about the original ones and when some of the original 440s were dressed up to look like them for some occasions, such as the only remaining Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy 440 and all four surviving from the Virginia and Truckee Railroad, and a few were dressed up to look like them for the 100th anniversary, and when a few were used for purposes at the site and promontory, and I will talk about the replicas too. by Rogers Locomotive and Machine Works in Patterson, New Jersey, and also it was the 1558 steam locomotive built by that factory. It was used on the Union Pacific Railroad after the ceremony, and also it returned to service as a freight locomotive on various locations on the Union Pacific. In 1885, it was renumbered as Union Pacific 353, and has continued its career for the Union Pacific. In 1903, the locomotive was sold for scrap and its historic significance was not realized until long after. About 100 years after the original one was built, a locomotive factory called Crown Metal Products of Wyano, Pennsylvania built a replica locomotive to resemble the 119 and it was built for Omaha's Henry Dorley Zoo in Omaha, Nebraska, and it's the first locomotive on the Omaha Zoo Railroad, and it is made to look like the original 119, but without the stripes on the wheels and artwork on the headlight and domes, and you could see how different it looks compared to the 119 in Promontory. Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy 35, which is named Missouri and was built by the Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy's Aurora Shops in Aurora, Illinois in 1892 and was leased to the Union Pacific Railroad and dressed up as Union Pacific 119 for the New York World's Fair of 1939 to 1940 and today it is on display at the Patey House Museum in St. Joseph, Missouri. Virginia and Truckee Lalvin, which is named Reno and was built in 1872 by the Baldwin Locomotive Works and today is the, it is the oldest surviving Virginia and Truckee steam locomotive in was dressed up to look like the Union Pacific 119 for the Centennial in Promontory, Utah, and today it is down in Tucson, Arizona at Old Tucson Studios and is displayed there. Virginia and Truckee 18, which is named Dayton and was built in 1873 by the Central Pacific Sacramento Shops and was dressed up to look like the 119 and was used in Promontory, Utah at the Golden Spike National Historic Site and today it is part of the Nevada State Railroad Museum in Carson City, Nevada and I will talk about this one in a little bit. 
another steam locomotive that lives at the Nevada State Railroad Museum, which is the Dardanelle and Russellville 8, built in 1888 by Cook Locomotive and Machine Works, and it was dressed up as the 119 for the 150th anniversary event being hosted at the museum, as you can see by this picture, and it's seen with the Virginia and Truckee Indio, which I will talk about shortly. Nevada Short Line 1, which you saw this picture earlier and was built in 1879 by the Baldwin Locomotive Works, and this one is a 260 mobile built to run on narrow gauge tracks and was loaned to the 1939 Golden Gate International Exposition, where it was restored to look like the 119 locomotive for reenactments of the Golden Spike ceremony. And today it can be found at the California State Railroad Museum in Sacramento, California. Pacific Railroad decided to end their practice of naming their locomotives and Jupiter's name was dropped, so it was just Central Pacific 60. Then, in 1885, when the Southern Pacific acquired the Central Pacific and began renumbering its locomotives, and the 60 became Southern Pacific 1195. In 1893, the locomotive was converted to burn coal, and later that year was sold to the Gila Valley Globe and Northern Railway and renumbered as Gila Valley Globe and Northern 1. In 1901, the locomotive was sold for scrap after its historic significance was not realized. Also, the Jupiter had three other sisters built along with it, which was 61 named Storm, 62 named War Whirlwind, and 63 named Leviathan. The Jupiter locomotive wasn't Leland Stanford's original choice for to pull his train to promontory. It was meant to originally be pulled by Central Pacific 173 that's named Antelope and was built by Norse Lancaster in Lancaster, Pennsylvania in 1863 and built originally for the Western Pacific Railroad, which had it designated H in keeping it, keeping with its alphabetic scheme and named its Sonoma. It became Central Pacific's 173 and named Antelope after the railroad acquired the Western Pacific in 1869. At one point, the two trains were to go through a cut where a logging camp resided atop of the hill and either the Jupiter did not wear the proper flag to designate an extra following close behind or the workers had failed to notice the flag. As a result, once the Jupiter passed, the workers rolled a large log down the mountain which struck the antelope and the engine damaged. A message was sent to the upcoming <coughs> station to hold the approaching train, and the train was taken over by the Jupiter. Then, in 1873, the locomotive was repaired. In 1886, it was sold to an unknown buyer. In 1909, it was scrapped. Also, the C.K. Holiday locomotive at Disneyland in Anaheim, California, 
it was modeled after the Antelope locomotive and it's Disneyland Railroad One and was built from scratch. And Walt Disney's 1-8 scale steam locomotive that he would often play with on his miniature railroad in his backyard known as the Carrollwood Pacific Railroad in the Holmby Hills neighborhood of Los Angeles, California and the locomotive named Lily Bell which it was named after his wife and it was modeled after the antelope. Virginia and Truckee 12, which was shown earlier and is named Genoa and was built by M. Bayer and Company in 1873 and when it was restored it was dressed up to look like the Jupiter locomotive for the 1939-1940 New York World Fair and 1948 Chicago's Railroad Fair where it once again appeared as the Jupiter locomotive and today it is at the California State Railroad Museum in Sacramento, California on display. Virginia and Truckee 22, which is named Inyo and was built in 1875 by the Baldwin Locomotive Works and was dressed up to look like the Jupiter locomotive and then 50 years later for the event at the Nevada State Railroad Museum in Carson City, it was dressed up again as the Jupiter for the occasion. Also, I will talk about this one in a little bit. North Pacific Coast 12, which you saw this picture earlier, and is named Sonoma, and was built in 1876 by the Baldwin Locomotive Works, and built to run on narrow gauge tracks, and was loaned to the 1939 Golden Gate International Exposition, where it was restored to look like the Jupiter locomotive for reenactments of the Golden Spike Ceremony, and today it can be seen on display at the California State Railroad Museum in Sacramento, California. In 1979, the replicas were being constructed, and also before the replica locomotives were constructed, the site thought, let's just build replica locomotives of the Jupiter and 119, so the Park Services first turned to the Walt Disney Company, but the Walt Disney Company turned down the offer because they didn't think that they would build replicas to within a quarter and an inch as specified by contract. The contract eventually went to Chad O'Connor, who was a friend of Walt Disney and fellow train enthusiast and the guy who helped work on the first two locomotives at Disneyland and Chad significantly underbid all other offers and even put some of his own money into the project just to have the honor of building this the replica locomotives and he built the replica locomotives at his workshop in Costa Mesa California and also the original blueprints of the original locomotives don't exist so Chad and his team had to use a micrometer to measure and scale up all the dimensions of the locomotives from historical photos and all the paint work was more of a challenge since color films didn't exist back then the only resource available were written accounts of the event and the various different shades of gray seen in the photos. Also, Ward Kimball, a Disney animator, contributed to the project, painting the original artwork on the locomotives, tenders, and domes, and also some other Disney people were brought in to work on the locomotives. The sand dome on the 119 has special detailed paintings of pioneers from the past on each side. On the left hand side of the dome is a painting of Johnny Appleseed. And the right hand side of the dome is a painting of Jim Bridger and no one knows what was on the right hand side of the sand dome so Ward just put Jim Bridger on it. Also, the color of the Jupiter was more of a challenge. 
there was an article found that the locomotive had been painted blue and the news reporter reported seeing the Jupiter coming out of the paint shops and it said it was blue and nobody knew what shade of blue he meant by that. And research proved that it was Royal Scottish Blue, but wasn't sh sure so of it the exact shade of blue. So in 1994, it was repainted blue as it still is today. And when this one was being built, it was just painted red. Then later, painted this color blue. Also, these locomotives today are used at the Golden Spike National Historic Park in Promontory, Utah for demonstration purposes and recreating how the railroads met in Promontory and driving of the last spike. In 1885, the Central Pacific was leased by the Southern Pacific. Also, Ogden, Utah was a better meeting point for the two railroads due to Promontory's remote location and Union Pacific sold their section between Promontory and Ogden <clears throat> to the Southern Pacific Railroad and the route through Promontory being remote had steep grades and was indirect since it went all the way around the north side of the Great Salt Lake and then in 1904 the Southern Pacific built a bypass so the tracks had to be rerouted across the Great Salt Lake it is known to be the Lucin Cutoff. Also the lake is about 30 feet deep and they were able to build the bridge out of 100 foot pilings and in a few places they just sunk into the mud and had to hook two of them end to end and they even used dozens of pile drivers and working in opposite directions and then meeting in the middle. Also, the Mid Lake Station was built so they would stop the passenger trains and people could get off and could have a good view of the Great Salt Lake and even take pictures and even take in the salty air. Also, people chose the route to see the sights going across the middle of the Great Salt Lake. Eventually, they had to give up the practice of letting people off. Somewhere in the 1940s, there was a fire. In 1950, they decided to build a parallel causeway just out of stones so they wouldn't have to worry about fires. Also, they didn't need the wood section, so they tore it out and sold it to other people who wanted the wood. As you could see, here's a bridge holder, bridge piling from the Lucin Cutoff, the original bridge, displayed at the Ogden Union Station at the entrance of the exhibit gallery, as well in the model railroad, a model of what it actually looked like when it was first built. In 1942 the line through Promontory was abandoned and the rails were pulled up and in the 1950s there was a renewed interest in preserving the original right-of-way through Promontory Point due to its historical significance about the Lucin Cutoff. Then in 1996 the Union Pacific Railroad bought, the, bought out the Southern Pacific and also the bridge on the Lucin Cutoff was replaced by a stone causeway and also most of the original Transcontinental Railroad is still in use. The 100th anniversary of the completion of the railroad was such an experience for everyone. Also, starting on March 4, 1969, the Expo train was on tour from cities like Los Angeles, California, Las Vegas, Nevada, and some southern cities in California, and even to Salt Lake City, and has reached Nebraska by summertime. The train was made up with some passenger coaches, and three flat cars and had 
Union Pacific chair car 5338, which you see right here, and was repainted for the Expo train, and it's a 1942 passenger coach built by Pullman Standard, and also today it can be found in Ogden, Utah, displayed at the Union Station. And as the paint aged over the years, here's how much nice it looked when it was painted this way. And the train even had some passenger cars, like I said. And even displayed there was the first DDA-40X Centennial 6900. And it was built that year because it marked the 100th anniversary of the railroad. Also, on the flat cars had some 1800s era equipment featuring the Virginia and Truckee locomotives, Dayton and Inyo, dressed up as the Union Pacific 119 and Central Pacific 60, named Jupiter, and were on the Union Pacific flat car 258-160, which both locomotives were on and also, while displayed, people even got to ring the locomotive's bells. Also, followed by behind the locomotives, featured on Union Pacific flat car 258-654, was blacksmith car, numbered as Union Pacific 2547, and Derrick flat car, numbered as Union Pacific 469. On Union Pacific flat car 258-655, featured a box car numbered and lettered as Union Pacific 4675, and the passenger coach, which it is Virginia and Truckee 3, and numbered as Union Pacific 35 for the Expo train, and it is at the Nevada State Railroad Museum in Carson City, Nevada. Also, the blacksmith car, the Derrick flat car, and box car, I believe, might all be at Old Tucson in Tucson, Arizona. Also, when it was close to May 10, there was a train to take people to the celebration on a two-week adventure starting in the heart of Manhattan, New York, to Ogden, Utah. The passenger train was pulled into the station by Penn Central Electric Locomotive 4626, which is a P2B electric class P motor type electric locomotive, and it pulled the train from Grand Central Terminal to Harmon, New York at the start of the train's journey to Utah. In 1967, Ross Rowland Jr., a Wall Street commodity future broker who's on the side founded and served as president of the High Iron Company in the mid-1960s, and his purpose was to restore mainline steam excursions using heavy-duty motive power, and in 1967, he had his eye set on a major publicity stunt for his company, and Two years later, it would be the 100th anniversary of the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad and the Golden Spike being driven, and he planned to commemorate the event by offering a heavy-duty steam-powered Golden Spike excursion from the east to Missouri, and while planning, he made an agreement with Steamtown to use one of their steam locomotives in exchange for excursion profits to complete a roundhouse for its engine collection. Also, the first leg of the journey, it was led by a 1944 Lima-built steam locomotive, that is, former Nickel Plate Road 759, and today it lives at Steamtown National Historic Site in Scranton, Pennsylvania, and it was steamed up in 1968. The auxiliary water tender behind it used to belong to a Norfolk and Western steam locomotive that was built by the railroad and later was scrapped years ago. And the water tender is at Steamtown National Historic Site with the locomotive and numbered as 759A, which it was when it was painted this way as well as the locomotive was and the train. The train was a total of 14 passenger cars, one RPO baggage car used as a tool car, three Pennsylvania Railroad baggage cars used as exhibit cars, two lightweight coaches, a pair of twin-unit diner, 
then three more lightweight coaches, a Baltimore and Ohio Stratodome car, once used on the Columbian, an ex-Canadian Pacific coach that was converted to being an open-air car, and a Pennsylvania Railroad observation car named Mountain View. Also, a dozen rail fans even got to chase the train and even watch it go by. Then, the, when the train approached Kansas City, Missouri, the 759 was taken off the train, and the original DDA-40X Centennial Locomotive 6900, which you saw earlier, and it led the train all the way to Denver, and it lives in Omaha, Nebraska today. Also, there were two twin... SDP 35s that were used to help the locomotive in case of mechanical failure. So the two locomotives were 1401 and 1404, and the SDP 35s that made the trip from Kansas City to Denver were also chosen because they were capable of generating steam heat for the passenger consist. And in 1985, the twin. SDP's 35s were sadly sold for scrap. Then the train was taken from Denver to Salt Lake City and then on May 10 the train was then hauled by Union Pacific 844 when it was numbered 8444 for that time and hauled the train from Salt Lake City to Ogden and the train then made it to Ogden, Utah, and people were shuttled by buses to Promontory, Utah for this celebration. And the celebration was a big success, like this one was in 2019. Then after the celebration, people then were going back to Ogden for the journey home on the train. And the 8444 pulled the train from Ogden to Salt Lake City. And then an ABB set of E-unit diesels were used to, for the trip to, from Salt Lake City back to Kansas City. Then the train was then reunited with the 759, but didn't haul the train all the way to the final destination. On May 16, the locomotive had been taken off the train in Baltimore, Maryland, and was then going to Lebanon, New Jersey for routine maintenance, and then in July that year it was repainted in its normal nickel plate road paint scheme, and then it later returned to Bellow Falls, Vermont when Steamtown was formally located there, and later was relocated to Scranton, Pennsylvania. Then from Baltimore to New York, the final leg of the journey was used by P former Pennsylvania Railroad GG14902 in Baltimore, Maryland to New York, which it was painted to match the paintwork on the passenger train as well as the 759. Right now I'd like to show you all my experience from when I attended the event. So first of all, here are the three original ceremonial spikes, and this picture was taken by me in 
These were when they were on display at the Joslin Art Museum in Omaha, Nebraska. And I was so glad I got to see them in person, as well as the racist promontory display they had in that gallery from October till January. And at the Durham Museum, they had a display set up on a wall on one side and the opposite side called After Promontory and they had it set up from since March 30th till late July this year and you could see all the photographs of what it was like after Promontory which was likely after the first transcontinental railroad was built and even some pictures of when it was being built. So yeah. May 9, I went to Ogden, Utah. And in Ogden, there was a heritage festival as a celebrating the 150th year of the first transcontinental railroad being completed. To kick off the 150th anniversary celebration, Union Pacific's hosted a special ceremony in Ogden with two steam locomotives there. The UTA frontrunner was coming in and out of Ogden, as you could see in some of my videos. K-44 was there, which you saw in the previous two scenes. And K-44 was built in 1944 as Union Pacific's last steam locomotive. And they also had 4014, the big boy locomotive. And also Lance Fritz, the chairman of the Union Pacific, signaled 4014 to pull into its position, as you can hear it in the background. Sorry if I didn't show his face on camera. I just had to have my camera face where the big boy was coming from. A lot of people got their cameras ready to get some pictures and videos of 4014 pulling in because we were all excited to see it coming in to face nose to nose with a right behind the car right there. I see it. Oh, it's a dog. Forty fourteen was just pulling into to the Union Station to face nose to nose smoke. with eight forty four. We all were getting some good footages and pictures for ourselves, and even the local media people got some videos of it. And even of us, as you can see, that cameraman right there. It was so great to see 4014 under steam again because it was finished just in time for the 150th anniversary of the Transcontinental Railroad's completion. And I was so fortunate to say Ed and his team did a good job getting it finished just in time for May 4, which it starts its, that was the day it started its journey to Ogden for display. So, isn't it a beauty? They did a good job on the paint work. All the parts are working well, and yeah. I'm so thrilled that 4014 is alive once again after 16 years. 
being on display at Rail Giants in Pomona, California. It was built in 1941 by American Locomotive Company, also for short, of Schenectady, New York. And also, it is one of eight surviving big boys left in the world today. And it was announced that 4014 will be doing a country tour this year. And you could see it now faces nose to nose with 844. 4014 and 844 did a double head run on the way to Ogden. And a lot of rail fans got to see 4014 and 844, and they were mostly excited about 4014, but don't worry, we still like the 844, and got to see running from Cheyenne to Ogden, and it was just an experience for all the rail fans who got their opportunity to see it. Next, we have Sandy Dodge, on its journey great, to great Ogden from Cheyenne. General Grenville Dodge, who became <laughs> Union Pacific's chief engineer. We had a great, great opportunity to see Railroad. here in Ogden. This, this is happening. And also, Margaret Yee, whose great great grandfather was a chef for the Central Pacific Chinese track game. It was one of these games who set a record for laying 10 miles of track. In a single day, a record that still stands today, 150 years later. To both Sandy and Margaret, we can't underestimate the impact. Right after the big boy pulled in, they announced today. the descendants of the people who helped to work on the railroad. I'm so sorry, the government reminds me. Vince, could you come up here for a moment, please? I'm going to tell a story where our special agent, Vince, comes up here to, to deliver a special package. This morning I had the great uh, honor and pleasure to represent the Pacific and give a few uh, interviews to the national media. When we were finished exiting the stage, a Vince had run across a family, one of you, somebody in this crowd who came here uh, because uh, Sally, her, her father, Mr. Gillies, who passed away roughly a year ago, his final wish was to become a part of the Union Pacific Railroad uh, by being consumed in the boiler of the great 4014, the big boy. She told me that story. This is Mr. Dillies, and I want to share with you what's written on his ashes. The last wish was for his ashes to go through the firebox of the 4014 Big Boy. It was his life dream to see one in action, but cancer stopped him too soon. He was a train engineer. He worked in the United Kingdom on the Swindon Railways, a continent away. And Union Pacific and the 4014 Big Boy meant that much to him. So we're going to honor that last wish. Yeah. And it's going to be our honor to do so. Thank you for reminding me of that, Governor Herbert. You know, we're going to close this event today the same way we close that epic day 150 years ago tomorrow. Then, they used the state-of-the-art communication technique in the telegraph, as they telegraphed to the country the completion. At 2.27 p.m. that day, a telegraph from Promontory, almost ready, hats off, 
Prayer is being offered. Chicago replies, we understand all is ready in the East. At 2.47, the telegraph from Promontory was the simple word done. So please join me in using today's modern state-of-the-art communication and share your location that you're here today by using whatever social media channel you use and tagging this moment, hashtag done.
starting at noon, they opened the Union Station. Also at the Union Station, they had the exhibit car along with the train, as you can see. But this is not the car that carried George Bush's casket inside. It's got a different number on it. And also, from 12 to 3 on Thursday, May 9, we were able to get into the exhibit car, but the next day it was till closing time. So also the exhibit car shows you how America has been changing all these years, how Union Pacific was changing as well from steam to diesel, and how the Transcontinental Railroad was built. And there were the place was so packed there was a lot of people looking at it. And also, the next day, the big boy was turned around and the train was just like how it was when it was on its way to Ogden. Then, later in the day, I went to Brigham City, Utah to see the depot and the caboose and did my videos there as well as I did in Ogden that at the start of the afternoon. And also you could see this is what was something for the 100th anniversary of the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad, a model of the Jupiter in 119, and a golden spike that shiny. Then, after... Visiting Brigham City, I came back to Ogden to do my GoPro videos on the trains I did, as well as the Union Station. And here's the diesel that was with the big boy in the 844, Union Pacific 2650. And it was with the train when it was leaving Ogden. And there was so much to see and do in Ogden, downtown Ogden, like there were stands and concession and food stands and also even had souvenirs for sale and bargains as well. And also there were so many activities and especially to see the train display in Ogden. And as you could see right here are two LGB models. And here there's one of the Jupiter and the 119 that they had an LGB tent next to the Union Station. Well, Inside the Union yet. Station there was a lot of activity going on, such as this one. I don't know if it's a great one. It's a big boy. And that other thing going on was a model to get us to on. May 10 was a big day, and it was the grand day because it's the 150th anniversary of the railroad being completed. There was so much to be going on in Promontory. And also, there was even as one performance in front of the two locomotives, as you can see right here, as well as an elementary school choir, as you can see those children on the risers. This, is, this act is based on how the Transcontinental Railroad was being built, the first Transcontinental Railroad. Also, yeah, as you can see, that's a caboose that was built for the performance. As well as that, later in the day, there was a music performance. There were music performers in the middle of the afternoon. 
I just liked how all those people, those actors, I should say, did for this show. It was, it was based off the original Transcontinental Railroad being built. She's a descendant to one of the Chinese workers who helped to build the railroad. This is a far cry from 50 years ago at the Centennial at Promontory on May 10th, 1969, when my mother, Mary Lee Young, was the only such descendant present. What the Chinese achieved for the First Continental Railroad was epic. The superhuman effort of a vanguard of Chinese towing locomotives and rails 28 miles over the summit and the building of 15 tunnels in the Sierra Nevada mountains. Scores were killed in explosions and in the horrific winter of 1866-67, work crews were buried by avalanches. Then, in the spring of 1869, out of the mountains into the desert of Utah, Chinese went from six inches a day building Summit Tunnel to laying 10 miles of track in one day. It took the incredible organization of wagons and cars and carts and horses and equipment and the teamwork of Chinese track layers and eight Irish rail handlers. This record-setting feat on the road to Promontory is unequaled in history. The trust and cooperation between workers with a common purpose was a zenith of the human spirit. The centennial was a grand moment to celebrate the monumental achievement the Chinese were part of. Yet, why were the Chinese denied their rightful place in history at the hundredth? Why was Philip Choi, president of the Chinese Historical Society, kept from making a presentation on the program? Why did the Secretary of Transportation, John Mulkey, state in his keynote address, who else but Americans could chisel two miles of solid granite? Who else but Americans could have laid 10 miles of track in 12 hours? Because the contribution of Chinese to the transcontinental was kept from national memory. The exclusion law of 1882 stopped the immigration of Chinese laborers all Chinese naturalization to U.S. citizenship. In effect, for 61 years, the law excluded the Chinese from American history. Today, we take this opportunity at the 150th to reclaim a place in history, to honor the courage, fortitude, and sacrifice of Chinese railroad workers and their legacy in America, which belongs to all of us. Here's Leslie Crossland giving her speech. Thank you Leslie so much is the to all of our partners, volunteers, of and Gold Spike National Historic for your Park. support. The landscape that is seen here at Golden Spike is mostly unchanged since 1969, 1869. And we want to recognize the area as ancestral lands of over 22 American Indian tribes. Since 1916, the National Park Service has been entrusted with the care of our national parks. We safeguard these special places and share their stories with millions of visitors every year. Today, I have the distinct honor and privilege to introduce the Secretary of Interior, David Bernhardt. Secretary Bernhardt leads a department which stewards our public lands, oversees the development of energy, supplies water to the west, and upholds trust responsibilities to federally recognized tribes. Please give Secretary Bernhardt a warm Utah welcome.
and then Secretary David Bernhardt, Secretary of Interior, came up to the podium and gave his speech. Good morning. Thank you, Leslie, for the introduction. And kids, you're phenomenal. You're absolutely phenomenal. <laughs> First thing I want to do is welcome you all here today to the Golden Spike National Historical Park, not site. And that's because Congress and the administration worked to get that law passed just a few weeks ago. <laughs> Ready? Three, two, one, this unveil is a the sign. sign that was revealed. Celebrating 150 years. So move over, Mighty Five. We are now the Super Six. This is a new sign. Please welcome the Utah Governor Gary Hurd, President of the Cameron Hills, and the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, O.C. Cameron President and CEO David. Also, this section of rails has a ceremonial wreath on it, and also the ceremonial wreath was placed on a sec this section of rail prior to a moment of silence for the workers who died con while constructing the first transcontinental railroad. As we had a moment of silence, they even played taps as we had our hands over our hearts to dedicate for them. Also, as you could see, they did the reenactment of how the two railroads met engines facing pilot to pilot as they did 150 years on ago on May 10. And also it was amazing to see the Jupiter and 119 matching as well. And we even all got to see it go by on the tracks. And also it's just a fun day. There was so much to do with Golden Spike National Historic Park. However, the visitors center had no access because of the event. But that's okay though. Well, there were a lot of people taking pictures, videos, and such. And also had a good time. Just like in Ogden, they also have the LGB tent with the LGB models of Jupiter 119 and even showed how they were um, meeting up with each other and reversing as well. I hope you all enjoyed seeing this video I made celebrating 150 years of the first transcontinental railroad in America. If you attended the event in Promontory, I'm glad you did. And if you had a good time, I'm glad you did as well as I did. And also, today America will always live on as it did for 150 years now since the first transcontinental railroad was built. And it always will in the future. And if you watched the first part of this video, hope you enjoyed it. And if you saw this part, thanks for watching and have a great day.